life comes from non-life. How is this possible, you say? Well, in this video, we're going to explain to you very simply what abiogenesis is. Stay tuned. In order for you to understand abiogenesis, you have to understand that life is not an object. Life is a process. Life is typically defined as reproduction and metabolism. These are things that molecules do, not what they are. Everything that makes up your body, from the cells in your skin to the elements and molecules inside of those cells, they're not alive. If you take a simple strand of DNA on its own, it's not alive. It's just a molecule. Your cells are just collections of these molecules. So life is not an object. Life is what emerges from non-living stuff, organic matter. At the very foundation of our existence are elements like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. All the above are elements found very commonly in the universe. We're not made of anything special. We are made of the same building blocks as all matter in the universe. But you'll see in this video that it's the way they're put together that makes us come alive. We are mostly made of carbon. And the reason why is because carbon is a very reactive element. Same with hydrogen and oxygen, very reactive elements. And what this means is they have a, a lot of um, electrons in the outer shell that they like to transfer over with other elements. They form bonds with other elements. And when this happens, you form molecules. And these molecules can now have a charge and they can bond furthermore with other molecules. So the molecules of our bodies are great mediums for other molecules to make bonds with. DNA is a macromolecule, a very long strand of molecules put together. So collectively, our bodies are these systems of electrochemical reactions occurring, this flow of ions throughout our bodies, this bioelectricity. The fact that I'm talking to you right now, that is a system of processes occurring in my body my lungs contracting and expanding, my brain thought processes occurring. These are all electrochemical processes that collectively make me and you happen. It's also important to notice that this matter wasn't just lying around and spontaneously produced a human. No, there was a vast sequence, a vast chain of events that led to DNA as we know today. And in this video, I will do my best to simply explain the, the major processes that have occurred. So, to go back to the origins of life on the earth, we have to go back about 4.4 billion years ago. This is when the earth was molten. It was hot, water just condensed. The first oceans have formed. At this point in time, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. There was only mainly methane and hydrogen and ammonia. There was no ozone layer. There was no protection from UV radiation from the sun. So that radiation was penetrating through down to the surface. It was mostly water on the surface. There was a very little land mass, mostly volcanic areas with perhaps lakes on the side, very hot lakes. And the moon was much closer to the earth than it is today, which means that the tides were stronger back then. Even in small lakes, you can noticeably see the tides because there's more gravitational effect between the earth and the moon. So this is pretty much what the early Earth was like about 4.3, 4.2 billion years ago. Now in the 1950s, a scientist called Stanley Miller wanted to reproduce these conditions to see what he could have produced from these early gases in the atmosphere. So he took those gases that I just mentioned before, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, put them in the flask, introduced electrical discharge to it to simulate lightning. And this process actually yielded multiple amino acids so amino acids, the building blocks of proteins in life itself, have emerged in a simple experiment with very simple gases. That was a profound revolution in biology where we realized the building blocks of life are very simply made on the Earth and in space. In fact, now we know that many other planets have amino acids on them. The building blocks of life are likely everywhere in the universe. They were that easy to be made. So with these amino acids being produced in the early Earth's conditions, we know that also was a circulation between the subsurface and the surface. As I said before, most of the surface of the Earth was ocean water, was salt water. And the subsurface were uranium geysers, nuclear geysers that produced heat and charged particles from the decay of isotopes of uranium. So in the subsurface ocean, where it was very hot, perhaps close to boiling temperatures. There was enough energy there to catalyze the reactions to turn these amino acids into peptides, smaller chains of, of amino acids. So 
these monomers can now circulate through the surface up on top to the subsurface. Introduced at the surface, wetting and drying cycles. This circulation process allowed these amino acids to become more complex, a chemical evolution. In the deep seas, we have hydrothermal vents. Near ocean ridges, where there's lots of minerals like iron and sulfur, and these also can catalyze reactions for these peptides and polypeptides. So in order to make a peptide bond, you need a carboxyl group to meet up with the amino group, right? These are basically the sides of amino acid bonding together and making a peptide. And these can link up further and make longer chains of polypeptides. So what we have is a very complex chemistry happening here, right? We have a circulation of amino acids and pet polypeptides being produced in the oceans circulating up to the surface, being exposed to rain and drying and wetting and perhaps UV radiation. And this catalyzed the reactions to make more complex chemical ingredients. Chemical evolution, we can see now is happening, where the chemicals that are destroyed in this process, they never come back again. And the ones that survive, they remain and they continue forward. Another key factor during this time, about 4.2 billion years ago, were amyloids. And these are sheets of polypeptides. So those polypeptides can now form sheets, connect with each other in sheets. And when these sheets grow long enough, they can break apart. And when they break off, this can catalyze the formation of new amino acids, new precursors to make a new amyloid. This is what scientists think is one of the first forms of metabolism and replication on the earth. Now it's not true life yet, but this is a, a proto-life. So you can see here that, that we have a slow incremental process where these simpler organic molecules become more complex, yielding more complex processes. Around this time, we see the first protocells emerge. And what that means is not quite a, a cell we know today, but a very primitive type of cell. And what this consists of is a lipid bilayer. So we know that lipid molecules, which is what we call fat, right? This is what makes up our cell walls. This fatty layer kind of encapsulates our cells, contains everything within it, the nuclei within it, and allows it to reproduce and, and things it needs to do. So the primitive version of this happened in the oceans about 4 billion years ago, where you have these lipid molecules form in the oceans due to carbon monoxide and hydrogen being heated with other minerals in the ocean, forming this these lipid molecules. And these lipid molecules, when you have enough of them, they can bond together. They have two sides to them. They're polarized. One side likes water and one side doesn't like water. So when you have two of them together, they kind of want to be configured in a certain way because of their different polarities. So when you have enough of these lipid molecules together, they form a sheet, they form a, a bilayer. One side is hydrophobic and one side is hydrophilic. So if you have a layer of these lipid molecules form a sheet in the ocean, it kind, of, it kind of forms a spherical structure due to it being in the water. And this spherical structure is what scientists think is the first protocell, which required amino acids to form properly. So we know that amino acids were also present during the formation of this protocell, which means that it was able to encapsulate this, these amino acids, these, these longer chains, and perhaps be one of the first proto-living beings. Not life just yet, but the beginnings of life as we know it. Again, this was all happening in, under the oceans, near hydrothermal vents, where you have hydrogen ions being spewed out of these, these vents, and heat as well, allowing this to catalyze the reactions to make this process happen. All these things require energy provided by the oceans. It's very hot and warm, and that's what provided the energy for these processes. They can spew lots of iron-rich material and sulfur-rich materials that allow these reactions to occur the way they had to. Now, nucleobases is what makes up DNA and RNA. Nucleobases are formed in very similar ways to amino acids. These also would have formed near the hydrothermal vents where there is iron and sulfur-rich material there as well. So these could have been the first enzymes, to, not, not enzymes as we know today, but the first proto-enzymes, the beginnings of the genetic code happening in the oceans 4 billion years ago. The problem is though that these protocells are parasitic to the ocean, hydrothermal vents. How are they gonna get to the surface and survive up on the surface when they need so much energy? As this chemical evolution process was occurring, there were some membranes that allowed for more sodium to be released 
in exchange for more positively charged protons. So it's kind of like a battery where the cell was able to spew out sodium and in the process obtain more energy. And this allowed these protocells to survive without breaking further and further closer to the surface of the ocean. And as time and time went on, this pumping mechanism in the cell became more refined due to chemical evolution. It allowed for less stuff to be spewed with more energy to be obtained. Now, how did DNA form? How do we get the, the amazing genetic code we have today? Well, there was no DNA back then. Four billion years ago, there was no DNA. But scientists believe, based on the evidence, that it wasn't DNA, but RNA. RNA allowed for a genetic code to be exchanged and replicated in a very similar manner to DNA. So RNA is a molecule that's made of nucleotides, and these nucleotides are made of sugars, phosphates, and nucleobases, all of which existed at the time, right? We talked about all these things uh, being produced in the oceans and on the surface. So now these organic compounds, these more complex organic compounds were able to survive longer near the tops of the oceans, in fact, near the surface, which before that there was not enough energy for them to survive. Well, now there is. Now, DNA is made of four nucleobases, C, A, T, G. RNA is made of four, but instead of T, it's a U, right? Uracil is replacing thymine. So when we talk about these letters that make up our DNA, right, all we're talking about are the nucleobases that were produced naturally in the oceans. Now, it turns out that when these nucleobases interact with clay surfaces, phosphates in the clay mineral, when introduced with these nucleobases, it kind of attracts them together and it catalyzes the reaction to bond these nucleobases together. We actually have seen the polymerization of RNA nucleotides based on nucleobases interacting with clay surfaces. And we actually have done this in labs and can verify this and we can actually produce RNA in that exact manner. Now, sugars that make up our DNA are uh, produced by formaldehyde molecules. It's a, it's a foremost reaction. So when you have the combination of those three ingredients, you get RNA, the polymerization of RNA. Now, of course, it wasn't this simple. Of course, there were many different chemical processes that led to this polymerization. Wetting and cooling cycles, drying and wetting cycles, all this, this circulation was continuing to happen. And this is what scientists think allowed that RNA to form. Once that RNA molecule is heated, it divides, it splits, and one side becomes a ribosome and one side becomes another part to be copied. And this was the first life. The first life, the simple RNA molecule allowed for the first life to occur on the planet Earth about 4.2 billion years ago. And since then, that RNA became activated and turned to DNA over many millions of years. And over time, you have cyanobacteria spreading oxygen on the surface, on the atmosphere. Plate tectonics occurred. They were able to go on land. And now you have the biodiversity of life we see today due to evolution. So that was a very simplistic way of putting it, but that's how we think life happened on the earth. Now, abiogenesis is a scientific theory that still has not worked out all the details. We don't have every single detail, but we have enough evidence to say that this is most likely what, have, what has occurred. And there is no need for a supernatural or a God to do anything. We don't have all the data, but we're working on it. And science is making amazing advancements in terms of abiogenesis. So as we saw today, life is an amazingly complex process. It really is a complex process. It took billions of years for us to get to the way we are today. And that's amazing. That's, in, that's an incredible journey. But when you understand more about the biochemistry behind life, you realize that it's not a special thing. Life is not some kind of special magical thing. It's just an elaborate natural process brought about by the laws of nature. As appealing as it is, and it really is appealing to look at life around us today and go, wow, it's so complex. There has to be somebody doing this. There's gotta be somebody. If you know the mechanism of life, you realize that you don't need somebody to make it. All you need are those laws of nature. The same laws of nature that govern black holes and stars govern our existence as living beings. So appealing as it is to say there has to be somebody involved in this, it's not apparent. But perhaps that's even a more exciting outcome to realize, that we are literally parts of the universe experiencing itself through this dance, this orchestra of molecules, 
that's something to be amazed at, to be all inspired by. That the molecules of our bodies, every bit of our bodies and living being are the same ingredients found in everything else in the universe. And we are just one way the universe can understand and experience itself. That is incredible, especially when it came about naturally, especially when you understand that it came about through a natural way. That the brain I'm thinking with right now, the life I'm experiencing right now is a product, billions of years of small changes. And through that process allowed me to think about what I'm saying today and recollect about how we got there in the first place. That's mind boggling to understand. It's amazing, remarkable, way more remarkable than just saying God did it or this guy did it. But the fact that we are here by natural chance or natural necessity, that is something that makes me proud to be human and alive.